Roger Bacon's fame is mostly linked to his plans for the reform of the studies and of Christian society, as well as to his earnest polemics against various features of scholastic culture. Why, then, should one inquire Bacon's ideas on such a scholastic topic as the status of natural matter? There are some good reasons, the first of which is that, notwithstanding his early acquaintance with Aristotelian philosophy, Bacon clearly voiced his disagreement with Aristotle about matter, writing that, quote, Aristotle's natural philosophy gives few certainties about matter, end quote. Matter is, then, one of the issues on which his critical attitude towards scholasticism and Aristotelianism focused, already in his early commentaries on Aristotle's physics and metaphysics, until it was fully addressed in his Communia Naturalia in the late 60s. In the commentaries, matter as originary principle, root and firm ground of natural processes had been given a preeminent position in comparison to the two related principles, form and privation, in Aristotle's doctrine. The idea that matter is not merely a logical abstraction led him, Bacon, to write that it be a liquid, something, although devoid of perfection and completeness, the residual something from which all other beings derive and in which they are dissolved. Moreover, Bacon observed that Aristotle's proposed different definitions of matter in different passages of his works, so that it was necessary to compile and compare them in order to obtain reasonable ground for discussion. Now, if no one among Aristotle's definitions of matter can wholly explain what Bacon himself had in mind, what did the name matter truly mean to him? Bacon himself gives different definitions of matter. First, he writes, in everyday language matter is considered the receiver of an agent's action, like fire is extinguished by, that is, receives the action of water. In this sense, matter is something concrete, a support on which something else acts. B. Bacon refers more than once to this commonplace definition that he also attributes to the so-called philosophantes, Christian masters who deal with theological issues from a philosophical standpoint. The second meaning of matter is the Aristotelian notion of that which, together with form, constitutes substance. This definition is, Bacon admits, the most true and rigorous. The adjective true sounds like his acknowledgement of a depth to scholasticism, to which he belongs and for which he does not want to be savoured. Indeed, he often claims to be a better interpreter of Aristotle's thought than the majority of university masters of his time. As regards matter, we perceive his will to deepen and clarify what's implied in the definition of matter as related to form as its other, alia a forma, especially stressing the substantiality and the reality, the status of creature, of matter itself. In a word, Roger is not convinced that the abstract notion of matter as mere potentiality is the ultimate philosophical word on matter, at least not for a Christian philosopher. Matter is something real, albeit incomplete. Consequently, the definition definitely endorsed by Bacon is as follows, quote, We call matter something which is potentially something else, like an embryo is potentially a baby, and this in turn is potentially an adult, and, generally speaking, anything incomplete in relation to its complement." End quote. This definition is especially useful to natural philosophers. Even the compound of matter plus form is, in this sense, matter, since any substance can be transformed into something more perfect thus playing matter's role in comparison to a more specific, complete substance. 
Here we can grasp one basic aspect of the concern that moved Bacon to revise the Aristotelian scholastic notion of matter. It was the problem of the permanence of something below all kinds of natural and artificial processes, first and foremost that of generation and corruption. All Baconian definitions of matter, indeed, focus on the real subject of generation and change. The road to doctrinal developments on natural matter had been paved by Bacon, Bacon's previous discussion on the uniqueness of matter. But if, from a metaphysical standpoint, matter is one, where does it become and begin to be called natural matter, thus becoming a subject for natural philosophers' discourse? As we will see, Bacon's discussion of natural matter lays the foundation for physics rather than being encompassed by it. This discussion, as it is developed in the Communia Naturalium, can be graphically synthesized in a schema like this. Natural matter is neither the first level of created matter, first matter or genus generalissimum, not one of the species directly deriving from it, spiritual and corporeal substances. In the ladder of creation, between first matter and natural matter, there is a second layer, corporeal substance in its two branches, celestis, heavenly, and non-celestis, non-heavenly. And since heavenly substance is not subjected to generation and corruption, natural matter pertains only to non-heavenly corporeal substance. The outline descent from first matter to natural matter then turns into a sequence of ascending degrees inside natural matter itself. Mixtum, animal seed, vegetable soul, sensible soul, animal, and man. The graphic also shows the coincidence of natural matter with the field of action of nature, which encompasses all bodies from elementary compounds to man. The process from first matter to natural matter, as well as the layered structure of the latter, reproduce the structure of reality outlined in Ibn Gabirol's Fons Vitae, although with a different bias. According to Ibn Gabirol, each degree of matter form compound follows another, so that it's impossible that two different kinds of beings lay on the same level. In Bacon's arrangement, as the scheme displays, the flowing of being of the Hebrew Neoplatonist is rendered as a series of descending dichotomies. Both philosophers, however, assume the existence of an intermediate level of reality which is void of reference to any being. Universal corporeal matter, materia universalis corporalis in the fons vitae, corporeal substance, substantia corporea in communia naturalium. This second level of reality is necessary in the ontological chain that links the first matter of creation to matter as we experience it. Yet, it shares the same minimal existence, virtual indeed, in both systems. At variance with, with Ibn Gabriel, Bacon's primary interest is, however, towards the third descending level, where, in the corporeal side of the dichotomic schemes in above, matter becomes the support of generation. Only there it becomes possible to know, quote, all that is necessary in the generation of natural things, end quote. That's why, at this level, matter is also called the root, radix, with a terminological choice that, once more, is parallel to that of Fons Vitae. By means of the distinction between different stages of matter, Bacon's dissatisfaction with Aristotle's idea of matter was at least partially resolved. The different ways the Greek philosopher had dealt with matter could be linked by Roger's new doctrine in a unitary process, 
so that a bridge was built between pure potentiality and concrete material bodies. Here we reach the core of the whole discussion on natural matter, understanding the status of matter as real creature. This is what compelled Bacon, a Christian philosopher, to argue so subtly about the notion of matter and to distinguish between its different degrees. Since it's impossible to demonstrate its status by considering created matter in its first degree, which is unattainable by senses, evidence can be gained first and foremost through the inquiry about natural matter that descends from that. At the level where material bodies exist, there operates nature, the principle of generation and corruption rooted in non-heavenly corporeal substance. There, the metaphysical flow, started by God's creation, gives way to the organization of the physical world, which ascends from elements and mixed bodies to man. Elements themselves, however, are not wholly encompassed within natural matter. First, they constitute the four inner cosmic spheres, which are neither, neither really subject to, nor wholly free from, generation and corruption. Indeed, the elementary spheres are incorruptible like heavenly spheres, even if parts of them may mingle, starting the process of generation and corruption. This double status of the elements, as cosmic spheres and as components of mixed bodies, is difficult to assess, and Bacon seems not to have fully gone through this difficulty, though he tries to explain that generation and corruption may occasionally occur in the spheres of the elements because of heavenly bodies acting on them. On the ground of the arguments developed, we can now suggest the reason why, in the Opus Tertium, the pages on natural matter, that are a mere cut and paste from the section of Communia Naturalium on which our discussion is based, immediately follow the page on alchemy. The idea of matter as something real and active was surely reinforced, if not primarily, primarily aroused in Bacon's mind, by his interest in the experience of alchemy and, in a wider sense, of artificial processes. It is well known that in his three opus of 1167, Bacon declared that alchemy of sorry of 1267 Bacon declared that alchemy natural philosophy and medicine are different languages that speak about the same topic the foundation of generation thus the discussion about matter in communia naturalium and Bacon's interpretation of Aristotle's ideas are probably fostered not only by doctrines coming from Ibn Gabirol's Fons Vitae, but also from the interest in alchemy witnessed by the English philosopher in his mature works. Matter was a central issue in the scholarly debate on alchemy, because of the critique to the reality of transmutation voiced by Avicenna in his text known as Shiant Artifices where the Arabic text affirmed that it's impossible really to transmute bodies, the Latin translator added, added the clause, quote, unless they are reverted to first matter, end quote. This sentence refuted the impossibility of transmutation, but at the cost of creating a major problem, since first matter in Aristotelian terms is simply unattainable, and in Christian terms, as created matter, it is unattainable by means of sensible knowledge. But if the common substrate of bodies could be stripped of all its forms by means of alchemical processes, and the formless material mass thus obtained could be explained as the third level of the metaphysical flow from first matter, then all this would render it possible to understand created matter 
in philosophical terms. The alchemical opus might be understood as a means of reaching the something that precedes all bodies and then of producing in material bodies the incorruptibility characteristic of non-heavenly substances. This is precisely the idea of alchemy which Bacon supported in his works and which was to promote the development of the alchemical philosophy that, a generation or two after him, emerged among practicing alchemists. The whole discussion about materia naturalis, in the end, suggests that Bacon, from his early teaching years, confronted the problem in conflict with Aristotelian philosophy, to understand matter as creature and not as a mere potentiality. Sooner or later, this conflict was reinforced by his taking alchemy under consideration. Using the Gabirolian distinction between materia and materia naturalis, as well as other intellectual tools available, especially subtle conceptual semantic distinction and semantic distinction, as a foundation, Roger Bacon built his new and sophisticated albeit not thoroughly refined the doctrine of natural matter. The research on which this lecture is grounded was discussed in the first seminar on Roger Bacon held at the CISMEL, the International Society for the Study of Medieval Latin, during the years 2009-2011, whose papers have been published in the 64th volume of the collection Micrologus Library.